Um, I don't really know how to start this video. Um, because I know that I've been inconsistent, and I'm really, really sorry about that. Um, I think I talked about this. I didn't really talk about it, but, like, going through some mental health stuff, plus just university in general. But we're not here to talk about university or anything like that. Today, I'm going to go through all the books that I read in February. Now, for those of you wondering, I did film a January wrap-up. Like, 1st of February, I was going strong, I uploaded it to my computer, and then my computer started doing some really weird things, and just wouldn't let me edit anything, and, like, the playback speed got super choppy, so I gave up. If you guys are watching this, then you know that I fixed it. If you never see this, then... It doesn't even matter, but that means I didn't fix it, so... Sorry! <laughs> um, so I'm really hoping that, like, a couple of things I did fixed that problem. But I decided that it was too late to f upload a January wrap-up, so I was like, I'll just do February and, like, pretend January never existed. It's fine. Based on the stack I have right here, it does look like I did a lot of reading, but I did have a bunch of library books that I had to return to the library. So, like, I did some fair a fair amount of reading. I did reread Heartstopper Volume 3 like three more times, so maybe I'll talk about that. Let's just get started. I'm also going to finish my tea because I'm kind of getting sick and this is the only thing that makes it so that my voice doesn't sound horrible. Okay, the first book that I want to talk about, I don't have because I got it from the library, is Obsidio by Amy Coffin and Jay Kristoff. Now, because you guys didn't get to see my January wrap-up, or, well, I might upload it. I might upload it eventually. I don't think I will, but, like, maybe. Um, I read Illuminate and Gemina in January, and I loved them. They were amazing. I think Amy Coffin and Jay Kristoff did an excellent job with, like, the multimedia and, like, the storyline. The fact that, like, the story arc still worked in a non-traditional story, I guess, storytelling way was really amazing. I was very impressed and I highly recommend the entire series. I did think that Obsidio wasn't quite as good as the other two. Like in Illuminae, we're just getting introduced to our two main characters and like, I don't know, it just felt a lot more high stakes. Like the first two books were super real. Like because you're in space, like they talked all about this like like really nitty gritty space stuff like running out of oxygen, like those things that you know, you think of on a spaceship, but like sometimes when you're writing you forget. So I was really like impressed that like, you know, they had all of those like details, I guess. I don't know why I'm saying like so much. I was really impressed they had all of those details in the first two books and they were really high stakes. There were a lot of like casualties and stuff. Um, which made it feel more real. And then we get to Obsidio, and like, yeah, there were some casualties. Yeah, there were some casualties, but it just didn't feel as high stakes as the first two books did. It kind of felt like the two authors took the easy route to appease the fans, if that makes sense, um, when it comes to character deaths. And that is coming from the writer side of me. The reader side of me would have rioted if any of the main cast had died. Um, but as a writer, I was a little bit like, well, I understand why you didn't kill these characters because it would have, it, it's nice to see them all alive, but like, you had an opportunity, they could have died, it would have made, it just, I feel like character deaths make the end result so much more successful. You feel so much like, no pain, no gain. So if no one dies, then the end result doesn't feel as worthwhile, I guess. But if people die, and like, sacrifices have to be made, and there's mourning at the end, but they still reach their end goal, I feel like that's a worthwhile ending. Yeah, I still gave, I think on Goodreads I still gave Illuminate 4 out of 5 stars because I did think it was excellent. I just think that it was like the two authors toned it down a little bit when it came to high stakes action stuff, and I wish that they hadn't because I feel like they were going in a really great direction in Illuminate and Gemini. Um, and then after I read that, I can't see my own handwriting. Oh, okay. So while I, in the middle of February, I went out to Switzerland, Germany to visit two of my friends because I had a break at school. And so while I was packing for that trip, 
I found The Person Being a Wallflower on Netflix, because it's not on Netflix in the US, but it's on Netflix here. So I was like, I really want to rewatch, or er, I'd read the book and I hadn't seen the movie, so I really wanted to watch Perks Being a Wallflower. So I did, and it was amazing. I, <laughs> I can remember a while ago, hold on. I can remember a while ago someone saying to me that, like, Emma Watson has a really good American accent in it, besides whenever she, she says the word Charlie, because the main character's name is Charlie. And I was like, wow, <laughs> I could really hear it, because she just puts too much emphasis on the R. So it's like Charlie, instead of the way a lot of Americans would say it. I just thought, I just thought that was funny. I think that the rest of the movie was amazing. Um, it was a really great book-to-movie adaptation, and because I watched that, I had the very intense urge to reread Person Being a Wallflower. And we all know it's a short book. I needed a short book before I left because I didn't want to start something new right before I left and then not finish it. Um, and it was at my local library, so I was like, why not? I'll just, you know, reread it. Um, and it was amazing, once again. I read it for the first time a little under a year ago, so it was like late March-ish, um, and I remember loving it then, and I loved it again when I reread it. The characters are just like beautiful. They're beautiful characters, I love them. Um, I can relate so much to Charlie as I had a lot of similar experiences in high school to him. And it just like, I don't know, I feel like that's the kind of book that I can read at any stage in my life and still relate to, even though every single time I've read it I've been older than Charlie, like, and like, already been through a lot of the things that he's been through. Just because of the way he talks and the way that he sees the world, it's like, it's very similar to the way that I see the world, and I feel like that's gonna be something that hits me no matter what stage of life I'm in. Oh god. I'm sorry if the lighting just changed. It's been sunny all morning, and then I sit down to film and suddenly clouds start coming over. So if it starts raining or something, nah, I'm sorry, but we've been having storms these past two weeks here in Bath, so. Um, anyway, what I was talking about, Perks of Being a Wallflower, five out of five stars, I loved it. It was beautiful and amazing, and now that I've been talking about it, I kind of want to reread it again. I'm not going to, but I kind of want to. Excellent. Okay. Next, while I was in Switzerland, I obviously had to go to a bookstore because I can't not go to a bookstore. And I wasn't going to buy anything because I was like, no, you know, you want to spend money on... And I started raining, of course. Um, I wanted to spend money on traveling as opposed to things I can get here. Um, but I found this book that I've been wanting to read for a really long time and I can't find it in the UK whenever I go into a bookstore, whenever I try to find it on Amazon or on... Um, Waterstones, it just doesn't come up. So I saw it in a bookstore and I was like, so I got it. And that book is Mooncakes um, by Wendy Zhu. I don't know how to say that name, I'm really sorry. I, I yeah. Um, and Suzanne Walker. And the reason that I'm really wanting to read this is it's like, first of all, it's right up my alley. It's a graphic novel. The picture style is beautiful, I love it. And it's about a queer witch and a non-binary werewolf. And I was like, I'm sold. I need to read this book. <laughs> and it has to do with baking and like friends coming back together after a long time. One of the characters is deaf or partially deaf. So there's disability rep um, and obviously queer rep since, you know, no matter who a non-binary person dates, it's always gay. Excellent. I feel like I don't know how else to describe it, but I also feel like you kind of have to go in knowing nothing because that's all I knew about this book. I just was like, okay, there's, it's a graphic novel, so I can read it pretty quick. And there's, you know, queer rep, disability rep, and there's like supernatural elements. That's a bunch of things that I really love. So I knew I had to read it and I did, I, I loved it. I want to reread it now again, just cause I feel like I could definitely get more out of it rereading it. I really hope the two authors write more from these characters, but like, just more in general, because it was beautiful, I loved it. Um, yeah. After I finished Mooncakes, which took me like two hours to read, it was an excellent evening, I started 
um, the Miseducation of Cameron Post by Emily A. Duncan. That's her name, right? Emily M. Danforth. Why do I always think it's Emily A. Duncan? Okay. Uh, the Perks... The, 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 the Miseducation of Cameron Post by Emily M. Dun Danforth. Emily M. Emily M. Danforth. Oh my goodness. I don't know why that was such a struggle for me. I watched the movie, The Miseducation of Cameron Post, which is on Netflix here once again, in November? October of last year? And it was a really, really powerful movie. But the thing is, is that I feel like the movie relies on you having context of the book because where the movie starts is halfway through the actual book. I feel like people should know this going, like, if you've seen the movie and you haven't read the book, which I think is unlikely, but, like, sometimes we do it. I am, you know, I did it, you know, it happens. The book starts out when she's, like, 12 years old and goes until she's, like, 17 or 18. She's 17 at the end. Um, and it doesn't, like, talk about every single year in there, but it, like, the beginning is, like, her growing up-ish, so it has different sections on focused on different ages and different um, time like periods of her life and then about halfway through the book is when the movie starts so I should probably explain The Miseducation of Cameron Post is about a girl named Cameron Post living in Montana yeah Mon she's living in Montana in the 80s or 90s I believe I don't remember the exact time period but it's like the 80s or 90s um, and she's gay and obviously well maybe not obviously but um, Montana was not exactly the most welcoming to gay people in the 80s and 90s. Um, so she stays very closeted for most of the book because, you know, what, what else is she supposed to do in a time when people would probably try to hurt her for being who she is? And yeah, it's a coming of age story that really doesn't focus a lot on her, per like, it focuses on her relationships but not in like a rom-com way it just has th they're there to explain a lot of her development but they're not there like as the main purpose of the story obviously the main purpose of the story is being a closeted gay teen in the 80s and 90s in montana it's such a hard-hitting film especially i just said film like i was a film a movie buff people in the U uk say film instead of movie a lot and so i've started developing like the habit of saying film instead of movie but the thing is is that when I say film it sounds like I'm trying to be pretentious whereas when they say film it's just normal so yeah I'm gonna try not to sound pretentious but I'm sorry if I come off that way <laughs> anyway I was talking about the movie but I don't remember what I was saying something about how it's I mean it's really hard-hitting and it's definitely filmed like an indie movie because I feel like I could rewatch it now having read the book and have a lot more context and depth. Um, like the book feels like a supplement to the movie as opposed to like a source material if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I don't know how else to talk about this. It was a really good movie and a really great book and if any of the stuff that's, that I talked about interests you, you should definitely go for it. I should say for the book there's definitely a lot of trigger warnings and like Google them. Go please Google and like do some research for all of them. I know there's a trigger warning for like self-harm, suicide. I feel like eating disorders a little bit, but like definitely less so. And homophobia, definitely. So if any of those, like if any of those things, I just, it's an amazing book and I want everyone to read it, but at the same time, I don't want anyone to get hurt. So make sure you like do your research, but read it if you can. Cool. I'm gonna stop rambling about this book now and move on. Okay, great. Next, I finally finished Words of Radiance by Brandon Sanderson. I started this book like at the beginning of January and I finished it February 15th, I wanna say. To get out to Switzerland and Germany, I flew and took trains. Um, so I had a lot of time to read. So in those two days when I had to do a lot of travel, I probably read about half of this book, which is impressive considering it's 1,300 pages. Or I think it's impressive, I shouldn't like. <laughs> Which is impressive, which I'm impressed by because this book is so long, so that's probably around 600 pages. And this book was even better than the first one. I think because I know the characters now, so I was more invested, and my favorite character got a lot more page time in this book than in the other book, because in the other book she wasn't as much of a 
and she didn't have as much of an important role but in this book her role like gets knocked up like two notches which is like thank you because she deserves to be on the same level as the other characters and I don't know why it took an entire book for that to happen but it's fine and just like the first book every time I tried to predict something that would happen in this book I would be so off like so off I still am shook by everything that happened in this book I need to start book three but I'm a little scared because like okay in the first two books Brina Sanderson all he does is expand the world. He expands what we know about everything. He like takes what we think we know and just like blows it up. He's like, yeah, you think you know that? Sorry, nice try. You know? And it's just like amazing and intense. And I was like, I couldn't believe when I finished this book that like far from anything getting wrapped up, we had more questions like that we needed to ask at the end of this book. So I was like, how does it, how, how does it, how, how are we going to get a next book? Is it just gonna like pile upon itself until we just have a blob mess? But no, okay, one of my friends has read it. He's the one who like lent the books to me. I think I've talked about this before. He said that like stuff starts to sort of get wrapped up in book three, so I'm a little bit less apprehensive, but I also kind of want to wait till book four comes out, but I kind of don't because it's so long. I don't know. This book is amazing. <laughs> Please read it. I know that the books look intimidating. I know, but if you, if this is your stuff, it's high fantasy, so like if high fantasy is not your thing, I understand. Don't feel pressured or anything. Um, but if this stuff is your thing, please read it. I know it looks intimidating, I know it can be hard, but it's okay. I read this book like in between reading seven other books or something like that. I read so many books in between reading this book because I couldn't devour it all in one go. I would have felt so unaccomplished. Even though this is such a long book, it would have taken me a month. And I would have read one book in a month. No, thank you. So the way I do it is that there's part, there's five parts in each book. So I read a part, and then I read another book, and then I read a part, and then I read another book. And if I have a graphic novel, sometimes I'll stop in the middle of a part and read the graphic novel because I know I can read that in one sitting. But when I'm reading this book, I like switch back and forth because if I don't, I'm gonna go crazy. But if like you're able to do that, if if this works out for you, please do it because this book is amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. There, it's amazing. Have I said it enough? It's amazing. I'm gonna cry because this book is amazing. How about I stop saying amazing and we continue on? Okay, great. Sounds good. Sounds like a plan. Next. Next, I read Solitaire by Alice Oseman. And I have put off, well, not put off, but like, I guess put off actually, reading this book ever since I found out that it was connected to Heartstopper. Well, not ever since that. Ever since I found out what it was about. Because I know that it's about someone with some anxiety and depression issues. And I know that if I had read this book at the wrong time, that would have been really harmful for my own mental state. Because, like, my own mental state would have bounced off what's going on in here and just, like, and that would not have been fun for me, let me tell you. Not fun at all. But I'm really glad that I finally got to read this, that I finally felt like I was in a good enough place to read this. And I still wonder if I should have waited it even longer because, like, I don't know if I was in the best mental place, but it was better than it had been. And so I was like, well, well, maybe, maybe, maybe we can do this. Maybe we can do this. This book is about our main character, Tori Spring, who... <clears throat> has sort of like disassociated from the world. Um, she's a year 12? I think she's a year 12, which for you Americans, yeah, she's year 12. For you Americans, that means she's 17 um, or 16. Is that how that works? She's in her second to last year of school. Year 13 is the last year of school. So she's in her second to last year of school and she's trying to figure it all out. Um, she kind of hides away from the world because she just never really believes that anyone wants to hear what she's saying, and so she just doesn't really say anything at all, ever. She keeps most of her thoughts internalized. She doesn't really have anyone to talk to until in the very beginning of the book she meets someone named Michael. And Michael's just transferred to her school from a different school, and he is a little bit, like, in his old school he was kind of known as, like, the crazy one, like the wackadoo. Um, so she's a little bit apprehensive about being his friend because she doesn't want to look like you know, another weirdo. But throughout the course of the book, she and Michael get in this 
like really really great they develop this really great friendship and it's just so amazing to see the two of them dealing with their own stuff and helping each other deal with their own stuff which is another amazing thing to see um <clears throat> Oh yeah, I should say, the reason it's called Solitaire is because there's a group called Solitaire that's like re um, wreaking havoc upon their school and the two of them are trying to figure out who's behind Solitaire and why, why them, why now, you know, why, just asking all the questions. Let's see, there are, once again, lots of trigger warnings. I think Alice Oseman has an entire like spreadsheet up on her website, so if you want to know any of the trigger warnings, please go check that out because once again, I don't want any mental or physical issues to come about. I I want to say eating disorders, self-harm, suicide, anxiety, depression. Yeah, if you are in the right sort of headspace and and or you enjoyed Heartstopper and want to read, like I definitely highly recommend this book and I can't wait for the Nick and Charlie um, novella to be out in paperback in the summer. I'm so excited because I just, I want more Nick and Charlie all the time. All the time. Just all the time. Sounds great. Okay, next. Next we have another graphic novel. Um, this one is Bloom by Kevin Panetta and Savannah Ganicho. I haven't tried to say those names out loud before. I just looked at them and was like, what? Ganicho? I'm gonna go with that, even though I'm probably wrong. And this graphic novel is about um, our main character, Ari, um, and then this is Ben. Hector. Why did I think his name was Ben? Anyway, this is about Ari, who has just finished high school, it's like the summer after high school, and his parents want him to stay in the house and help with their bakery, but all Ari really wants to do is move with his friends to Atlanta, Georgia, um, because they live in Florida, to start a band together and, like, try to make it big in the music industry. Um, so he's a little bit like fighting with his parents on that and because his parents are making him be in the bakery all the time um, and he wants to leave, he's like, oh, I should hire a replacement, someone who can help them when I'm gone. And through this, he meets Hector, who is in the area. He's taking some time off of his baking school courses to help pack up his dead grandmother's home in Florida. And he sees this post for you know, opportunities at a bakery, and he gets really excited, so he and Ari start working together in the bakery, where Ari's trying to teach him, like, how everything works, and Hector is, like, trying to get some hands-on experience, basically. Um, and it takes place, like, over the summer, so lots of stuff, lots of stuff, and it may or may not be gay. Yeah. Is that why I picked this up? Uh -huh. We'll never know. This book was really cute. I, I really enjoyed it. It was a really great read. I love the way all of the character dynamics were addressed in here. You could really tell the way that the characters interacted by the drawings, which is like, obviously it's a graphic novel, that's how it should work. But I just felt like the way that the characters were drawn, the illustration style was just really great and had a really good, they all had really good interactions and stuff. I don't even know, I'm just rambling now. We're gonna move on. Okay. Next, I read Down Among the Sticks and Bones by Shauna McGuire, um, which is the second book in the Wayward Children series. I have an entire book talk about Every Heart a Doorway and how much I freaking loved it because I freaking loved it. So go watch that if you haven't. This book follows two of the characters that are in Every, Every Heart a Doorway named Jack and Jill and their adventures. I really, really loved this book. Um, it just... The way that it's written is amazing. So the thing with Jack and Jill is that they're, when they were born, their parents didn't think they were, well, their parents knew they were going to have twins, but their parents thought they were going to have two boy, a boy and a girl. So when two girls came, they sort of didn't know what to do with themselves. And then because the two girls were like, were identical, they wanted to make them look as different as possible. So when they were really young, their mom took Jillian out and like cut her hair really short and bought her a whole bunch of like tomboyish clothes and Jillian became the tomboy and Jack um and Jacqueline or Jack became the like girly girl and so the two parents pushed these idealized sort of stereotypes onto their children without letting their children pick what they want to do 
And the way that it's written, the way that Sean McGuire addresses this, like, how this happens and, like, everything, it's just, it's just mind-blowing and amazing. And, like, seeing their adventures and, like, the way that they, you know, interact with the world is just, like, oh, amazing, amazing. I want to reread Every Hard Doorway now because I have so much more insight into the two characters and I want to reread that knowing all of this. If that makes sense, and just like, I love this series. Um, I need Beneath the Sugar Sky immediately. Is that the next one? I believe that's the next one. I feel like I should double check. I'm gonna double check. Yes, okay, I was right. The next one is Beneath the Sugar Sky, and that's, I need to read it immediately. But I also like, I wanna collect them all in hardcover because I know they're still coming out, and they look so nice in hardcover, but the hardcovers are expensive. So I keep just finding them on sale and just being like, hmm, sale, I will buy you. Um, and especially because the narrative isn't continuous, so I believe at least up to like book three or four, it's focused on different characters. I think in book five the characters all start coming together, but like so far it's each focused on like a different character set of characters, so like that, that helps. Read it, read it, read it, read it. I feel like I say that about every book. Okay, we're almost done, we're almost done. Next I reread Clockwork Angel by Cassandra Clare. And I wish I had my pretty hardcover copy because my hardcover copy is beautiful, but it's fine. I didn't have room in my very full duffel bag to bring it back with me. So I got them from the, heart, from the books. I got them from the library instead because I figured like support your local library and I don't have to pay for shipping to get my books over here. That's such a first world problem. I sound really stupid right now. Anyway. I haven't read this book since 2017. So the first time I read these books um, was 2015, like 2014, 2015 was when I first read them. And then I reread them for the release of Lady Midnight in 2016. I reread them for the release of Lord of Shadows in 2017. And then I didn't have a chance to reread them in 2018 when Queen of Mary Darkness came out. So I wanted to reread at least, because I'm not gonna reread the whole thing, but I, I wanted to reread at least these three um, this trilogy before The Last Hours, because although I know that, like, it's not necessary to read The Last Hours, it would be nice to, like, refresh myself on what happened in these books to sort of, you know, under like, just have some better insight about what happens in The Last Hours, basically. Um, and it was so interesting rereading it to see how differently it hit. I don't know, one of my fears rereading these books was that I would think that they were all like, I don't know how to describe it, like I would reread them and just see all the flaws instead of seeing all the things that I loved. Like I would reread them and see all the stereotypes that perpetrated the beginnings of these series um, because of the time, because of a product of their time obviously, like this is when they came out so they worked with the norm. And then once Cassie made a name for herself, she was able to like expand. Although I saw those things, they didn't really matter to me because I knew that they were coming. And so it wasn't like I was sitting here like, oh great, here's another like troubled bad boy, blah, blah, blah. Because I knew that it was coming because I've read this book before. But because of that, I got to see all of the like, what am I trying to say? What am I trying to say? I got to see all of the amazing that made me love it in the first place, I guess. I guess is what I'm trying to say. What else? I guess it's just like, I wish I had my hardcover copies because I wanted to tab and like, cause I started tabbing books like once in a while. I don't do it insane amounts like I've seen some people do, but like every once in a while a passage will just like, you know, and I'll be like, well, so I tab it. Yeah, so I had like a couple of those which I wrote down on my phone so that I can do it when I get home. I feel like I had more to say. Mm. One of the things I did want to say is that rereading Clockwork Angel, I definitely saw like Tessa's initial like feelings for... I guess when I first read the series, I didn't pick up on this because I was 13, 14, well, I was 13 and you know, I had no idea what relationships looked like. I still don't. Don't get me wrong, I still don't. But I, I didn't have much of an idea of like how this stuff works and I feel like now I have a, a better idea because of like, you know, my friends and TV shows and movies and books and stuff. And rereading this book, I could really see Tessa being very much attracted to Will and not attracted to Jem in the least, 
which well, I found surprising because I think when I first read the books, like I I did really like Jem and I kind of liked Jem more than Will at some points. But rereading them, I was like, how? Like rereading this book, I was like, how was Jem ever even a part of this? Because like she just sees Jem as a best friend and nothing else. And I'm currently reading Clockwork Prince, and so I see it more in there. But like, she has this immediate attraction to Will. Like, why doesn't she see that it's not Jem, it's Will? Sorry, my Team Will shipper heart just like jumped out there. I'm really sorry about that. Anyway, and I just really love all the discussions they have about books in this book. Just, just so cute, so cute. Finally, um, okay, those were all of the books that I at least partially read in February. Well. I partially read this book in February too, so I might as well talk about it. Um, Clockwork Prince um, by Cassandra Clare. Like I said, this is the book I'm currently reading. I am currently 252 pages through, so I'm about halfway. And this is the book that I remember the least of the series. Because like, I remember the first book because I, I can remember like most of the major plot points in the first book. And then I can remember like the second half and like some of the events of the first half of the third book. But this is the book that I feel like I remembered the least. I remembered I remembered a couple of things and like I'm sure a couple of things are to pass. This is the first book that's actually like shocked me with what happened even though I've read them so many times because I didn't really remember what was going on basically is what I'm trying to say. I forgot how much I love Will. I know that might not seem particularly obvious because like I just freaked out about Will about Clockwork Angel but like I forgot how much I feel for Will in this book and his struggles and <clears throat> the way that he pushes himself away from everyone it just it physically hurts me to see him being mean to Charlotte and even when he hurts Jem and Will or Will of course he hurts himself but like seeing him hurt Charlotte and Tessa and Henry just like makes me want to cry because when I remember when I first read these books like I didn't understand I was like you're being annoying I hate you why are you like this and having the force like the foresight having like read the entire series already I knew what was coming so I was prepared ish but I wasn't prepared for how much I would how much indignance I would feel on Will's behalf because I, I know what's going to happen and like how many times I would be like oh my gosh you're being stupid just say something and just like frustrations after frustrations after frustrations and I need to stop talking about this because I'm gonna start crying. Mm. The other thing that I really enjoyed was like seeing like the very beginnings in Clockwork Angel a little bit and Clockwork Prince um, of Tessa and Magnus' relationship because like we we see their relationship develop in some of the other series which is really great but like I shouldn't say develop because we see we see them in here where they barely know each other and then we see them there when they're like best friends and we don't really get to see any of the middle stuff and so like I would love to see that and I hope I get to see some of that in Chain of Gold but it was really sweet to see a couple of things in this book and in Clockwork Angel that like really connected Tessa and Magnus together like right off the bat which I thought was really cute and something I didn't notice before and I'm really happy about because Magnus and Tessa have such a and I'm like um, I just they're such they <laughs> I feel so bad for them and they have such a good relationship with each other and I just I want them to be happy I want them to be happy I'm like honestly I often wonder if like rereading Clockwork Angel and Clockwork Prince I am starting to wonder if, like, I don't know if Tessie did this intentionally, but like, Tessie, I don't know if Cassie did this intentionally, but it feels a little bit like Tessa has some aromantic qualities to her. Not that she's explicitly aromantic, because obviously, like, those words didn't exist then. Um, aromantic, asexual. Same thing. Not same thing. Because of these two books, it made me feel like she was on that spectrum. Because... She's immediately attracted to Will, but she doesn't really fall for him until, like, a lot of emotional connection is formed. And Jem, she doesn't have any sort of physical connection to Jem until after she's gotten to know him, which is a very Demi quality. So I'm like, hmm, maybe Tess is a little bit asexual, aromantic, and, like, just, I don't know. Just, I just, 
I'm probably seeing things that don't exist, honestly. But I think that that's a little bit of what I saw in, like, what I saw in Tessa that I felt in myself. Like, the way that she feels about the world, the way that she feels about books, the way that she feels about Jem and Will. Just, like, mm, It's beautiful. Even rereading it as an 18-year-old who has a lot more knowledge than 13-year-old me did. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. I don't know why I read about that book for so long. Those were all of the books that I at least partially read in February. That was... how many books was there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I read... or I read parts of ten different books this month. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I'm pretty proud of myself. Although I did read more last month. I read like 15 books last month, which is insane. But I still read ten books this month. That was good. Um, here's to a good March. <laughs> um, I hope your guys' readings, reading month went well. Let me know down below in the comments if you read any of these books and you liked them, or a book that you read in February that you enjoyed, or a book that you're excited about coming out soon, because Chain of Gold is coming out two days from this video. I just pre-ordered it. I'm so excited. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye.